well, I will say with confidence that I think we need more of is in in our, in our country is more cooperation. Right? Things have gotten so polarized and so everyone's digging their heels in and creating echo chambers around themselves and and, and getting self righteous about their view on the world. Fundamentally, we do not have the luxury to fight amongst ourselves because of all of the things that you have just raised, right? There is rising influence from China, from Russia. There are all of these wars and these big global challenges that we are facing, not just as a nation, but as a, a human species, right? So all of this bickering and this partisan nonsense is just partisan nonsense. We have bigger fish to fry. Let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think we need a lot more of that cooperation and that coming together as like. Former CIA agent Rupal Patel today, stay tuned. For me, and I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, you don't realize how impactful uh, the job that the analysts do, right? Especially. Yeah especially female analysts right because when you think of the cia you think it's a yeah. it is a world it is a male dominated world for the most part and yeah and in your and, you, and in your <laughs> yeah. book and in some of your talks you talk about um sorry uh, that's okay you talk about you're surrounded by all these alpha male navy seal mm -hmm. type guys you know mm -hmm. and i think what was it uh the movie zero dark 30 where you have jessica is it chastain? jessica chastain yeah, yeah chastain where where uh, she literally is the person behind, at least the way it's portrayed. She's the one who yeah. kind of connected all the dots. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of my favorite things that happens in that movie a couple times, and and I I want to see what see if this happened to you is uh, a couple times there is this thing where she wanted to say yeah. something, and of course some of her colleagues and maybe some of her higher ups were saying, "Don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything," and finally she says. Man, this is what's going on. I'm the one who found it. Did mm -hmm. you have that where, where sometimes you were being told to not say anything, be quiet, play along? No. Okay. I, I, yeah, I think I was really lucky. And I do think there was an element of luck here. Uh, because when I was working on our Afghanistan account, I had pretty much nothing but exceptional leaders. So it was good because they sort of took the hit uh, or shielded us from that kind of politicization, from that kind of nonsense. Um, so I can't think of a single instance in which I was told to sort of hold back or um, to qualify anything. That's great. That's great. It's yeah. Just, it, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, and one of the things that, uh, that, that I like about your, your story as far as uh, identity and accepting mm. your weirdness because we're all weird yeah. and stuff like yeah. that, <laughs> is that, is that we all have to people have to allow other people to put put out an idea right we make this big push at least here in the yeah. u.s for diversity mm. and what i find is sometimes yes we're, we're meeting maybe the the minimum required of uh, requirement of diversity but we're still not mm accepting different ideas we're not being mm -hmm. diverse when it comes to ideas and thoughts yeah. and so i think that that's still a thing that that you have some thoughts on that yeah no and i think what's so interesting funnily enough i was having a conversation with a friend earlier today in which we were talking about a very uh challenging ceo that she was the coo for and we were talking about some of his extreme behaviors, you know, ridiculous things like picking favorites, um, having different criteria for others. Some person, some people would get, you know, up to three months of, of paid leave for medical emergencies. Others would get six months because they were, you know, um, favorites of the sea. And, and anytime he was pulled up on this, he, his response would be like, oh, well, you know, no one will find out. So if we're inconsistent, it's not a big deal. And some of this sort of uh, just make the rules up as you go mentality and also his very my way is the right way or the you know it's my way or the highway kind of thing and we were just chatting it through and, and she said something so insightful and I think this is probably true in many cases not all but many cases is like he was almost playing at what he thought a CEO should be like right this this mythologizing of like CEOs are like literally fist thumping and shouty aggressive in your face 
again, my way or the highway, there's no room for discussion, no room for um, challenging views, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, the reality is there are human beings who are like that, but because there is so still this pervasive idea of the CEO of this as this like godlike untouchable figure, and this is purely in the media, right? Like this is the way media often portrays in movies and in shows and even in sort of the social conversation around it. Yes, that exists, but that is not the only way to be a leader, the only way to be a right. CEO and sort of circling this back to this idea of owning your weird. So much of the work I do when I am working with execs and advising execs, it's about understanding, well, what are you, what is your way of leading, right? You don't have to follow a par paradigm or an archetype or even a role model that you had people like, oh, well, that guy was so visionary or this person I worked for was so inspiring or the CEO before me did X, Y, and Z. Yeah, cool, that's great. Let them do their thing doesn't mean that has to be the way you do yours and, and and allowing for a diversity of leadership styles of approaches to leading of approaches to decision making etc cetera, etc cetera, is something that as you said is still so lacking because there is so much of this like performative uh leadership absolutely i uh, i'm reminded of steve jobs uh, he was kind of a weird leader uh, and and also uh very uh sometimes very aggressive or very uh, mm -hmm. what do you call it? Hard fisted, right? I, mm -hmm. I've interviewed several of Steve Jobs' employees, former employees. And one thing they all have in common is they've all been fired by Steve Jobs at least once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was like his thing of getting, you know, yeah. trying to get more out of you or better out of you or trying to wake <laughs> you up. He would fire you. And then yeah. like a week or two or three later, he would hire you. And I met this one lady, I, 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 I apologize, I don't remember her name, but she, I think mm -hmm. by the time she left, working with Steve Jobs, she had been fired like six or seven times. And, and, that, yeah. and you know, what's so cool about that story, aside from that, it just gives him another weird quirk to talk about, is also the humility involved in that process. I mean, at some point it becomes just a bit of a weird compulsion, right? Like hiring, firing the same person multiple times is maybe you've got other things going on, but also the acknowledgement that actually maybe I made the wrong decision and I'm going to be humble enough to to go back to that person and admit that I was wrong. And I think that's also something that is a bit uh, lacking is this, is the humility to acknowledge when you've done something wrong or to accept and own that you might have made the wrong decision or that you were, you know, you were just uh, didn't have all the answers or whatever it is, right? Not to say, oh, you know, um, like I never get anything right, but to at least have that self-awareness of like, actually, no, that was the wrong thing. And I'm going to go back and try to fix it. I think that's yes. really, you know, something that we need, could do a lot more of. Absolutely. I think that goes from uh, from the, uh, what do you call it, from the dining room table to the boardroom table. You said right? it. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. You said it. Yeah. And, you know, it's the cool, the, one of the great things about being at a place like the CIA, we were empowered to say, I don't know. And I think that lesson of being in a room full of, you know, whether it's the president or senators or, you know, the secretary of state or whoever it was that you were in front of, you didn't know the answer. You didn't make stuff up, right? This And there was this both unwritten, but also very uh, commonly acknowledged rule that you accept and you own when you don't know the answer. You don't make stuff up because the stakes are too high, but you don't just leave it at that. You don't just say, oh, well, I don't know and just deal with it, right? You say, I don't know. I will find out and come back to you with an answer. Or I don't know. There is a gap in our collection on this. We will fill that gap and come back to you once we have better insight, right? So it's not just a, a, a sort of wallowing in your ignorance and, and being like, oh, well, I don't know the answers to anything. It's no, uh, know what you know, be very clear about what you don't know and be willing to acknowledge that, but then fill those gaps. Yes. And I remember, I don't know how many leadership classes they talk about that. If you don't know something, admit it, find the answer. What's the next step? How do I overcome this lack of knowledge? And every now and then you will find individuals who hate to admit they don't know mm -hmm. and they will make things up or they mm -hmm. will, whatever they do. And, and, and then they, they end up getting found out that they don't know what they're talking about. And then they get lambasted because, look, you didn't know what you were talking about, as opposed to saying, you know what, I don't know. I, I remember watching an interview and with Mark Cuban and they asked him a question. He said, you know, I don't know that. The interviewer says, wow, that's so refreshing to admit that you don't know, because this guy, right. he's considered a thought leader. He's got, yeah. you know, he's got these companies that he's run. He's a billionaire. He should know everything. But the reality is we don't. 
And that's the other thing, again, this whole mythologizing of leaders and le what it means to be a leader is this idea that you are all knowing, all seeing, all powerful, whatever. And that's total nonsense, right? The reality is the Mark Cubans of the world have the confidence to say they don't know. They're not going to pretend, they're not going to you know, buy into or perpetuate that idea that they have all the answers because they don't, right? Again, it goes back to that humility and that self-awareness of like, you know what, I am confident enough in myself and I know what I know and I acknowledge what I don't, but I'm not going to pretend otherwise because that doesn't serve anyone. And I think that is, again, one of those really refreshing things to see, but it shouldn't be refreshing because it should be more commonplace than it is, right? But some <laughs> of it is the expectations that are put on leaders to know all the answers and to be able to predict the future. And so it's not just about their egos. It's also about the expectations, whether from boards or from, from the electorate or whoever it is that like, but we put you in that position. You should, you know, know more, do more, see more, et cetera. And, you know, yes, you should have expectations, but tempered with reality, right? right. Nobody is all seeing, all knowing. You can never be. That's right. That's right. And I think mm -hmm. back to what you said, you have to, first of all, be confident in who you are and then be humble enough to say, I don't know. And mm -hmm. if you are a confident person, then not knowing shouldn't bother you that much. It, it should, again, like you said, we're not going to know everything. It's impossible. Yeah. And depending on on your area of expertise, things have changed. Yes. Uh, you know, what we knew was what yes. was working, let's say a couple of years ago may not yes. be working today, may no longer yes. be valid. Exactly. Science changes all the time. It's so not knowing yes. and admitting it is should be OK. Yeah, that's but that's the first step in the process of then finding out and learning. Right. And I yes. think the idea is not to begin to move away from this. Uh, and I like sort of. Um, easy mnemonics for these things, but move away from the idea of the all knowing to being the all growing, right? Being willing to grow, to learn, to push yourself, to stretch yourself, to fill those gaps and not stay stagnant, but not perpetuate this idea that you you are fully formed and perfect as as, as you are, because there's always uncertainty. There's always uh, something that you couldn't have planned for, you couldn't have predicted, and also so many things out of your control, right? So let's acknowledge that and, and, and be grownups about this. Right, right. I love that. All knowing, to all growing. So, which is ultimately what life is about. You're constantly expanding, right? Uh, yeah. Every now and then I hear somebody say, well, they usually use it when it comes to money, right? Well, how much money does one person need? Well, that's just one way of, of measuring things. But I always look at at somebody who has a lot of money and what else are they doing with that? So yeah. I know Bill Gates gets a lot of guff, but the guy has spent yeah. a lot, literally billions of dollars with different yes. charitable organizations yeah. trying to do different things. Uh, uh, other wealthy people have done the same thing. So it's not just money, but yeah. I always look at it as, can you have enough intelligence? Can you have enough love? Can you have enough health? Can you, can you have enough uh, closeness with your family yeah. and the people who are important? So the universe to me is, is about expanding. It is about more. Yes. You know, what is yes. the next level? Because back in the day, they would quit their jobs. And I think the historically, there was like, they would live like 18 months on average, 18 months after retirement, because they had mm -hmm. no next goal. They were just sitting yeah. at home waiting to yeah, die. No and purpose. That's it. And so yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, if you're, if you want to be, if you want to fulfill your potential, it is about what's next. And also expanding this idea of wealth, right? Yes, wealth yes. has a financial component, but there's you can be wealthy in relationships, you can be wealthy in uh, emotional intelligence, you can be wealthy in just your um, your skills. There, let let's be real, the financial part is important, right? And it and once that is the basics are covered there, it enables you to have a more expansive view of of the other things. But wealth can take many forms, right? And all of us can think of financially wealthy people who might be really impoverished in other aspects of their lives, right? Whether it's their physical health or their emotional health or well-being, their relationships, their whatever it is, right? right. It's not an either or. And I'm not making that argument either because I think there's so much overplayed um, sort of hype around this idea of like, oh, well, rich people are miserable and rich people are all selfish and greedy and, and you no, right? There's no way you can categorize any group of anyone in any very reductive way, right? There are miserly right. rich people and then there are very generous rich people. There are miserly poor people and there are very generous poor people, right? And everything in between. Right. But the reality is we get to choose the kind of wealth that is important to us. And so it can be financial. It can take many, many, many other forms as well.
Yes, absolutely. All right. So I got to ask you, are yeah. you from New York? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you're, you're uh, and, and, and your parents are from India or, or were they yep. born here as well? No, my parents were born in India and then they moved to your, New okay, York. Your parents in, are from India. Yeah. We came from Cuba. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this about because there is certain things that I remember, at least from my parents, and, and I'm going to mm -hmm. eventually get to my question for you. You know, my parents were really big on uh, working your butt off, right? It's all about hard work. And so uh, my dad used to be a big thing. And his thing is, you know, you don't have to give a crap about anybody else. As long as you have integrity and you work hard, mm -hmm. you know, you'll be successful. So that's one of my values that I took away from my parents. What about your parents? Some of the same stuff there? Definitely. I think it was uh, this idea of, yes, definitely working hard, but with the end goal of being two things. One is trying to fulfill your potential, whatever that looks like, whatever direction that takes you, and also giving back. Right. So it was never enough to just be successful or to reach whatever personal ambitions or goals or whatever else that you had. The idea was always, how can you lift as you climb? Right. How can you bring others with you? How can you help those? Even if you're only marginally better off than they are, how can you help them? And the the running joke in our family growing up, because my parents were the first in their respective families to move to America. Um, you know, we often used to refer to our house as the Patel Motel because <laughs> there were always always people living with us for extended periods of time, cousins of friends of aunts and uncles. Like it didn't matter how far removed the connection was. My parents' view was if we can help, we will help. We don't care if there are, you know, sort of people are, you know, two, like two to three squashed in a bed and we're having to, you know, make all kinds of adjustments in our personal comfort, in our personal lives. We will help whenever we can in every way we can. And that came from, thankfully, from both of my grandparents and it was fed down into my parents. And then they sort of, they didn't even really talk about it. It wasn't a, a, often, a, a, sometimes it was an explicit conversation, but we saw it, right? We saw it happening. We saw the sacrifices they made for others that they made for, again, total strangers sometimes. And for me, I won't speak for my siblings. And for me, to be honest, there was a lot of resentment around it, right? It was like, well, why do we have to help these people? Why can't, you know, why do I have to share all my toys with all my annoying cousins? Or like, you know, very selfish, um, limited view of, of, of life, right? At right. that time as a child. And then I grew up and I realized that actually this idea of an expanded sense of community and this, this almost universal sense of, uh, of obligation to others, right? To help those that you are in a position to help is a, it's not fun when you're living it, but it's such an important lesson, right? And it is something that has informed everything that I've done as a grown up, as a, you know, someone who has my own, you know, sort of choices and agency and all these things now. But I didn't like it at the time. Right? It was a right. tough lesson to, to, but with the benefit of hindsight and maturity and, and perspective, I realized what a huge, huge gift it was to have both that, like I said, drive for self-improvement, but also social and community improvement. I'm interested to find out. So were your parents a very typical Indian family? In other words, did, did they want you to date only other, let's say, yeah. Indian <laughs> boys and, and, and things of that nature? Or yeah. did they let you become fully invested in your American dream. <laughs> Do you know, it's so interesting. They were, I would say, traditional in some stereotypical ways, for sure. Uh, but so liberal, you know, sm sort of small L liberal in all the important ways, right? So I think, yes, did they have preferences? Of course, right? Most people have preferences because they think that, you know, it's sort of whatever they think. Right? I'm not going right. to project anything that I have never asked my parents about on them. Yes, the preference was for sure that I would ideally find someone who is Indian or Indian American and and you know we'd be able to preserve the culture and the language and et cetera et cetera. Things didn't work out that way, right? And that and that was the beauty of my parents is that yes, they had goals, aspirations and and sort of uh things that they would have liked, but they were never obstructionist when we chose a different path, right? They again, stereotypically, both of my parents are are doctors. And the assumption was always that I would be a doctor and that me and my three siblings would be doctors only one of us made that choice and my parents were so supportive of it and they were always willing to adapt themselves 
to who we were as individuals. So yes, they had preferences, but they were never locked into them. They were never uh, prescriptive about how we lived our lives, who we chose to love. They were ve are very, very broad-minded and again, very community-minded, right? They recognize that excellence can come in many forms. Love comes in many forms. Good people exist everywhere, right? So it's not just... And so from in all of the practical, important ways, they are incredibly, incredibly, actually in all of the ways, right? They are very liberal. Yes, they had a preference, but they weren't going to lock me in my room or force us to do anything other than what we chose as, again, smart, intelligent, well-raised, you know, full of the right values individuals. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and I think that when... Uh, the same way in my family, you know, I'm Cuban, I should be dating Cubans and, and all that other stuff. But yeah. uh, like you, I went a different way. All right. So uh, you go from and then you talk about this in the book and, and also in your TED talk, which I, I just adore the TED talk because you, oh, you spent quite a bit of time with the identity that we all deal with, how yeah. out of place we are, especially, you know, here you are, you're attending a Catholic school. And mm -hmm. you're this Indian girl. So that had to be mm -hmm. rough. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. again, growing up with an immigrant background, English to me was the second language and, mm -hmm. and not being able to speak it well and, and, yeah. and stuff like that. But but you we all go through that transition, right, of feeling mm -hmm. awkward and feeling weird and trying to fit in. And and then as we start to get to know ourselves we're able to shed some of not not necessarily our weirdness but shed the the what do you call it the need to fit in as much right. and and i think that that is not something that uh is taught mm -hmm. and i think that not only should that be taught at home but really should yeah. be taught in school because school yeah. is is like this crucible if you will of <laughs> of trying to you know there's so yeah. much going on in school yeah. right so yeah so I love the fact that you bring this about in your book. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we should mention book that uh, your book, it's right there in the background. It's from CIA to CEO. Yeah. And, and um, it's also been called one of the best uh, uh, books on business by uh, mm -hmm. Harper Bazaar there. Okay. So let me ask you this. So here you go. You go from weird girl feeling awkward to how did you get to the CIA? Yeah. So I was uh, getting a master's degree in international affairs and had fully intended to actually join the State Department to take the foreign service exam and go that route into the diplomatic world. Uh, and then while I was getting this degree, uh, someone from the agency invited me to apply. And it was not on my radar. It was, uh, I didn't even think that there was scope for someone like me in a place like that, because like most people, I just assumed what I saw in the movies was all that the agency was, right? So I was like, well, I don't really want to go out and be a spy and like, you know, like drive Aston. I would love to drive an Aston Martin, but I knew that wasn't part of the job description. <laughs> um, but I was like, sure, let me just see, right? Because I have, a, I, again, I'm very open-minded to ideas. It doesn't mean that all of them are good ones, but right. I hadn't considered this. Let's let's get some more information and see if there's something here. And so I had a conversation with this this man uh, who ended, ended up later on being my, my boss and got to know a bit more about what I would be doing, the kinds of work, the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of training I would receive. And I just thought, oh my gosh, yes. Like you could not have come up with a better combination of things that would tick literally every box that at that time, and even to some extent now is important to me. So, you know, having an impact, getting to be, you know, a nerd about things that are of, of tangible importance to my country, uh, getting to live and work overseas, being, you know, trained in different languages and different skill sets, physical skill sets, as well as intellectual skill sets. And, you know, the way I refer to it in the book is sort of it appealed to both my inner nerd and my inner badass, right? Like there are these two very uh, seemingly opposing, but very intertwined elements to, to my personality. And, yeah, the CIA was like, holy cow, I had no idea. This is like literally the dream job. And it was. And anyway, so that's how it happened. Uh, but it was not part of this big grand plan of like, that. I'm going to do this and then do this and then do this. It was a bit more um, organic than that. Right, right. OK. And so <laughs> you tell your parents, hey, I'm going to go into the CIA. And what was their reaction? They so my dad loved it. My dad 
still to this day thinks that I, I single-handedly was behind every single headline in like the foreign, you know, the foreign politics section of the New York Times, right? Like, he's like, oh, I just read about this. Was that you? And he's like, when you were away on that on that trip, did you do that? And I was like, God, how many of me do you think I am, right? Like, we haven't figured out how to clone people yet at the CIA. So no, I, I'm not behind literally every major event in the world. I'm not behind any major event in the world. Um, but so he loved it. He was all about it. And uh, proud dad, proud dad, very proud dad. I think my mom was also proud and also very supportive, but a little bit more, um, uh, just a bit more reserved in her exuberance around it. And also probably a bit more concerned for my physical safety and what that meant for my physical safety when I was traveling and working overseas. So there was never a question as to whether this was a good idea or I made the right choice or, and again, I was, and still looking back on it, it was, you know, some of the most fulfilling years, years of my life. And I remember very vividly having a conversation with my father where I was saying, you know, I, 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 I wake up every single day excited to go to work. And he was like, Rupal, if you have found something that can sustain that level of excitement for you, that is a rare opportunity, a rare gift that you have been given. Do not let that go. And I and and so I did it for a while. Right? I mean, eventually I did let it go, um, but not because it became any less fulfilling or any less interesting. And and that's you know we can go down that route if you'd like. But yeah, they were nothing but supportive. They were really gracious. Also, when I couldn't tell them what I was doing, when I couldn't, which was a lot, when I couldn't tell right. them where I was going. And I think, you know, as long as I was able to check in with them in some capacity, they were okay, okay enough about that, un not knowing what was going on. Yeah, that has to be probably the worst for parents. Uh, mm -hmm. I have, I'm blessed. I have two boys and three girls. And, uh, you know, again, because of my, the way I was raised, I'm very, very, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, protective of all my kids, but especially sure. my three daughters, right? And, and so, I think that would be definitely very difficult. Uh, yeah. and, and but again, as a father, I'd be bragging to all my friends. Yeah, my daughter <laughs> did that. Yep, yep, yep. She did that. <laughs> whether whether it was true or not, I'd be bragging about it all day long, right? Because that's that's yeah. what that's what you're supposed to do, right? All right. So yeah. So, uh, what got you to go uh, leave? I'm sorry. What got you to leave mm. CIA? Yeah, so I wish there was like a like a sexier, like bigger answer than this. But the, the the honest answer is two things. One, with the benefit of hindsight, I real realize how ridiculous this first response is going to sound, but it is true. I was approaching my thirties, so I was at the CIA from my early twenties to my early thirties, and as I was approaching thirty, I remember thinking, "Oh my god, this is a big milestone!" Like after this, like. I'm like, it's all downhill from here. Right? <laughs> and I remember very con. Yeah, it's so stupid. Um, And I remember <laughs> consciously thinking to myself, if I don't leave now, I will, I won't, I would be too old for anybody else to, to hire me, right? <laughs> because I'll be over 30. I know, I know, Bert, I, please, like, I, 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 I wish I could somehow uh get into the heads of anyone who has this idea about like how old certain ages are because and, and as you and you probably recognize as well like the reality from what we think and what is true is so different and and 30 is i am not trying to be patronizing but you're still really damn young at 30 right <laughs> um anyway so it was like if i don't leave now i'll be too old right i'll be past my my expiration date so either I make a conscious choice that I will be a lifer, a careerist here at the agency, and I would be very happy and very fulfilled, or I leave now before it's too late, see what else is out there. If I like what I see, cool. And if I don't, I can always come back, right? So that was one element of that conversation. And then the second element, and it's somewhat related to the idea of like, well, let's see what else is out there, was also let's see what else is in here, right? I had done so much incredible, fulfilling, interesting, exciting, uh, stretching work that I had never thought that I would be able to do. And, and again, all of the training and the you know, exercises, et cetera. And I just thought, what else, what else am I made of? Right. Like let's, let's test this. Like you've already proven to yourself that you can do things that you never thought you could, would be able to do physically, mentally, et cetera what where where's that boundary right like again it's this idea of like pushing myself and testing myself and seeing 
or pushing past what I thought were my limitations, or at least testing what those limitations might be. So I figured, you know, let me go out there, test myself in new ways, see what what else is going on, what else I am made of, and and then see what happens. So that was those were the sort of the two conversations. But there was nothing pushing me out. There was nothing pulling me to it. Literally, the only thing I knew with some degree of certainty was that I wanted to live in London. I had, you know, traveled to London a lot. I had, you know, for some reason, there was something about the city that really captured me. And 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 so when I was thinking about, well, what next? How do I, you know, where do I go from here? How do I even decide what happens, right? Like there's so much possibility. There's The world is massive. Uh, that was the one anchoring sort of data point was, I want to try to get to London somehow. <laughs> so right. that's that's why. And that's that's sort of what happened next. That's cool. That's cool. And, and that is pretty funny. You're right. That's, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm my expiration date is right around the corner. I'm turning 30. And, and yeah, oh that, gosh. that is, that is silly. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Uh, and, and for our audience, I, I do want to mention this. It's in the book uh, from CIA to CEO. You had multiple war zone experiences. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, in, 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 uh, you talk about, um, uh, again, catching a plane, a secret plane in a secret location, and you're landing in another secret location. You're surrounded by all these, uh, again, tough guys. Everybody is armed. They're, they're, they, You don't say they handed you. I like the fact that, I think it was in your tech talk, you talk about yeah. they threw you a yeah. bulletproof jacket. There's no, uh, <laughs> the, oh, let me help the, uh, yeah. the female here. Here you go. You're yeah. one of us. Yeah. Just slap yeah. it on. And, yeah. and and you talk about I love this. You talk about uh, peeing in buckets. Yeah, uh, which we all love to do, especially women. Yeah, it's a skill. Uh, it's a skill, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, sleeping in storage facilities, right? Yeah, and, and stuff like this. So yeah, this has got to be a very again growing moment, right? These these mm -hmm. things you're either going to sure. shrink or grow. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what I love about those environments. I I really like. Um, I don't seek them out. In this instance, I did seek it out because I volunteered to to go uh, to the war zone. But um, but I because it really is the ultimate test, right? Like, and as you said, you either sink or you swim. And most people will swim, right? When forced to swim, you will you will find a way. And that's what is so great about again that experience is that you realize that we are all, and I fundamentally believe this, we are all infinitely capable it's just we lack opportunity we like whatever else it is or you know sort of exposure who knows but i didn't know that i could do that right like i it's not fun peeing in a bucket or sleeping in makeshift you know sleeping arrangements and and all of the the big and small discomforts and whatever at the same time right like get a perspective because I was not on the front lines, right? I was not in a combat role. I was not literally putting my, well, in some ways I was probably generally at risk, but I didn't, you know, I was not, I am not in in, the, in any of the armed services. I never was. And so I also had this sort of, if I'm, in, I, I'm sort of in a very lucky position, right? Because I am here at will. I can leave at will. My tour is so much shorter than, anybody, especially on the US side who was doing tours overseas. So I had nothing but respect. And again, that humility of like, I have nothing to complain about, right? I get to right. go back to my pretty relatively comfortable situation. Uh, I can go back to headquarters whenever I want, I mean, not whenever, but you know, there, there was a lot more um, agency. And I, I don't mean that word sort of, or I don't mean that. Pre -agency. Time, there was you a lot more. Yeah. yeah, right. I, I could I could decide things a lot more. I had a lot more flexibility and room to maneuver. And so I am I think I'm pretty good about keeping perspective in any difficult situation about like, yes, it might be tough. And a lot of people might not be comfortable in the situations that I've put myself in. But I also don't have it that bad. Right. There's always someone who's like sacrificing a lot more and who's going through a lot more. And so it was not as hard as I thought it would be, if I'm honest, right? And of course, then I have the support of this incredible organization around me. I have really wonderful colleagues. And yes, it was not by any stretch of the imagination, a comfortable or an easy experience, but it was made more comfortable and easier because of some of the things that I had and some of the people around me, even if they were in almost without exception, you know, sort of very alpha sort of manly men, right? Like, right. that also is a bit of a stereotype. And I, and I think I do mention this in the TED talk, 
And this is sort of circling back to something you you brought up earlier, this idea that we're all weird in some way, right? We have these stereotypes and these archetypes of what a special forces man looks like or is like or what someone in the military is like or what an agency a CIA person looks like. The stereotypes are exactly that, right? They're in, more often than not made up by Hollywood or magazines or some form of like mass media. The reality is always so nuanced. And so I worked with some really incredible special forces men, and they were all men at the time, um, who had eating disorders, right? Who had confidence issues, who had imposter syndrome, who felt, yeah, all of these things that you would never put in the same sentence, right? One of my favorite examples, and, and he's still a good friend of mine, a Navy SEAL who, you know, did some of the hardest training any human being could ever go through and then some. And he was also an English major at the Naval Academy. And he and I would talk about Dostoevsky and the books that we were reading. It made him no less macho, right? And he, and he, to his everlasting credit, he would make fun of this like performative macho culture, right? Because we all had call signs and and some of the guys would have names like Oak or Duke or like Butch or, you know, whatever, like something really tough and manly. And he, he was like, my call sign is going to be cupcake, right? Like I'm going to laugh at all of this because let's be real people. Like we're, we're all on the same level. Like let's stop with all of this, like chest beating and like, right. you know, whatever we're doing here. And I loved that about him, right? And he was a SEAL, so he had nothing to prove. Again, it goes back to this idea of having that deep inner confidence. You right. don't have anything to prove, right? No one is going to question your masculinity because your call sign is cupcake, right? <laughs> like <laughs> you, you're, you embody, like you're, you're enough. You're enough as you are, right? You don't have to prove anything to anyone. But first and foremost, you don't have to prove anything to yourself by some of the trappings of like how you talk about yourself and how you, you know, sort of talk to others, et cetera. So so much nuance, so much shades, so many shades of gray, um, and an incredible, incredible, yes, as you said earlier, formative experience in, in all of the, the ways possible. All right. So what was your call sign? Arsenal. <laughs> Arsenal. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so the reason I chose Arsenal, and this is going to, I don't know if we have any soccer fans amongst your audience, but I played soccer my whole life uh, from like kindergarten through high school. I loved the game. I've always loved it and uh, was sort of brought into the world of English soccer in the early 2000s. And uh, Arsenal was the team that I was sort of introduced to and at the time fell in love with the coach, his ethos, his way of leading, his management style, and also some of the players. And like they were just a really solid team. Anyway, uh, so Arsenal was my call sign because I loved the, the soccer team. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So based on your experience, do we need more CIA or less CIA in today's world? Oh, Ooh. I don't know if there is an easy answer to that. My, I think I'm glad the CIA exists. And every time I despair of what is happening in the world, I always think, I know there are good people in that building who are trying to make it better. So I can't say if we need more or less because I haven't been in the building for over a decade now and I have no idea as to you know the spectrum of what's happening. All I can say with confidence is that I'm glad the agency exists. I'm glad the people that I know who were there have now sort of raised are, are much more senior and are doing incredible things. And I know there are so many good, thoughtful, um, yeah, just people who have our country's best interests at heart. They're not partisan. They're not, you know, one thing or another. They're not, they don't have an agenda other than, which is the, the not the agenda, but the, the oath we all take, which is to protect our country from all threats, right? Foreign and domestic. And and so I'm glad that the people who are in that building are in that building and 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 I imagine are still continuing to do amazing work. Um, I hope that they have the resources they need to do the thing that they need right. to do. Uh, but more or less, I can't say. I, yeah. I genuinely can't say, but I'm just glad that they're there, that they're there. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think I think uh, that, that's a good sentiment. I mean, look, uh, the reality is. The CIA is a secret organization. There, there's, there's so much that they do that we don't know that they do, right? And and they don't take credit. It's not like they make they a press conference, right, and say, "Hey, yeah. we just we just stopped this yeah. terrible thing from happening." Exactly. 
so yeah. uh yeah god bless yeah. god bless them and, and the rest of our intelligence people and in our military because we, we certainly need them and i think uh my opinion is we probably need more i think uh there is uh uh you know, there, there's a lot going on, and and mm -hmm. look look what's happening now. We have Russia, mm -hmm. we have uh, Ukraine, we have Hamas, we have uh, I forgot what the other one was, but there's a lot yeah. happening. All right, there's a lot. Right. And I, sorry, one thing I will stray. Maybe we're getting a bit uh, political here, but I will say one of the things that I, and again, this is not well. well I will say with confidence that I think we need more of is in in our, in our country is more cooperation right things have gotten so polarized and so everyone's digging their heels in and creating echo chambers around themselves and and, and getting self-righteous about their view on the world fundamentally we do not have the luxury to fight amongst ourselves because of all of the things that you have just raised right there is rising influence from china from russia there are all of these wars and these big global challenges that we are facing, not just as a nation, but as a, a human species, right? So all of this bickering and this partisan nonsense is just partisan nonsense. We have bigger fish to fry. Let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. And I think we need a lot more of that cooperation and that coming together as like, yes, there are many things that make us different as Americans, as individuals and as groups and whatever else. Fundamentally, though, we believe in certain values. We need to defend those values, both at home and abroad. These are not things that we can take for granted, but we need more coming together. And that hopefully will can help at least in the short term to keep it from being like, well, the military is the solution to everything or espionage is the solution to everything. Yeah, fine, they're enablers and they're protectors in many, many important ways. But fundamentally, we need to restitch that fabric of American society that has come become a bit frayed, well, a lot frayed recently in the past sort of decade plus. And that, that all of us have to do that. It's not just for the politicians or for the elected officials or whatever else. We all need to do that because we all rise or fall based on what's happening in the rest of the world. And we are letting those things happen while we're fighting amongst each other. So let's not yeah. do that. Yeah, I agree, I agree. I, I think that, that's uh, I think that's uh, absolutely right on target there. And and it's so interesting that, that you're on the show today and you had the CIA background because one of the things that I said, oh, I don't know, uh, a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine and I said, you know, because we have this, this polarization it would be so easy, especially with all the AI tools and the yeah. deep fake videos. It right. would be so easy for one of our enemies of course. To, to really exacerbate what's going on. They could put out a and fake video. Yeah, they could put out a they fake are. video or, or fake tweets or they could mm -hmm. they could really manipulate us so easily because, as you pointed out, we're fighting yeah. so much among ourselves. Yeah. We're not trying to take care of our country. It's just this bitterness and we're digging in and uh, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're setting yeah. ourselves no. up. We're, we're, we're setting ourselves up for massive failure. Yeah. And we don't have to, right? There's nothing inevitable about that. We can all fix this. No one wants that outcome, right? None of us, no matter how much we might fight against each other, nobody wants to see a world in which we have less power, less influence, less legitimacy. And yet, you know, we are creating the conditions for that to happen. And as you said, you know, let's not be naive here, people. There are lots of foreign actors and, and we have seen in previous elections when there has been interference and fakes, fake news and sort of wedging these divides even further and further apart. That's not that's not inevitable, right? That's not something we should enable or that we should encourage in any way because it does not help us as a country. So fundamentally, <laughs> we need to figure out a way beyond beyond this or through it, right? Like let's have right. honest conversations, fine. But yeah, we can't afford to see that that legitimacy and that power and that control. Because to what and to who, right? What's the, what's the other option? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, so so. Let's dive into this a little bit. Again, the book is from CIA to CEO. So how did your experience at the CIA shape your approach to business and leadership? Talk about this. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of big ones, and I've said it a couple of times already, but the idea of humility in leadership was something that I really 
I didn't realize it at the time, but that it, this is something that I very consciously now have internalized and, and sort of have brought into my leadership roles. Because one thing you realize, and this comes from being in the field or even at headquarters, right? One, no matter how much information you have, there is always something unknown or sometimes something unknowable, right? So yes, do the best you can to fill those gaps, to answer those questions, do all of that great stuff. But at some point you have to always leave room for new information to come in and change your mind or your perspective in some small way. Doesn't mean you'll always get it, doesn't mean it'll happen, but at least leave room for that possibility, right? That humility that like you don't have the answer, that there are perhaps many answers and you have just decided on this one given what you have you know, at your control and at your command right now. So that humility to, like I said, leave op- leave room open to for for challenging ideas or new information to to change things a little bit. In that same way, it's or expanding that a little bit, it's the humility to also acknowledge all of the things that are out of your control. Because you know, again, I will use the CIA example. You can have the best mission plan, the best resources, the best people, the best thinking and all of the contingency planning. And the second that plan goes into motion, every single potential thing that could go wrong, will probably, right, Murphy's Law, right? <laughs> like things go wrong. The world is an unpredictable place. Sometimes things like the weather will mean that you can't, you know, sort of take off in a helicopter or a plane until hours later or some other, you know, seemingly, um insignificant element of things sort of literally throws a wrench in your plans. So again, that humility to acknowledge that control the controllables and let go of this illusion or delusion that you can control the outcome. You can only do what you can do right in the moment, like given the realities of this unfolding situation. And so it's always, again, to just go into it. Yes. Be prepared, do the as much as you can, but always acknowledging like, Things aren't going to, the world has no uh, interest or has no stake in having things unfold the way we want them to unfold, right? So let's be real about it and let's acknowledge when, yes, hopefully things go to plan and it all like just sort of, you know, beautiful and seamless. Sometimes that happens, right? So it can happen, but very rarely. So acknowledge and accept how much is out of your control. Stop worrying about it. Stop obsessing over it and just focus on the controllables. I think those two lessons have fundamentally altered not just the way I lead, but the way I live my life, right? The things that I choose to worry about, the two things that I uh, I lose sleep over, all of these things. It's like, okay, fine. What can I do about it, right? Because either I can complain right. or, or either I can complain and do something about it or I shut up, right? Like there's, for me, it's not enough to just be like, oh, I just need to get this off my chest. Yeah, fine, get it off your chest if you need to like vent the emotion, but then what are you gonna do? What can you do about it? Where none of us is totally helpless, is totally powerless in any situation, even when we can't control so many of the things that affect us, what can you do about it? That that resilience, I think that is really what it comes down to is this uh, this mindset of like, The world will do what it does. People will do what they do, right? As much as we would like to be able to like influence and control others, like, again, that's, that that there's a very, there's a limit to how much that, that works. So just own it, accept it again, control the controllables and move on. I would say fundamentally those, those two things have probably just shaped everything that I do and and the, and the approach that I have with it. Um, And then also this, uh, and this is, I guess, sort of somewhat related, but to acknowledge, and this ties in a little bit to to some of the stuff I talked in my te- talked about in my TED talk, is to let people surprise you, right? Oh yeah. Because we all go in, in into this into any context, but in a leadership context, it's maybe particularly damaging. Sometimes we have preconceived ideas of who this person is or what they're going to contribute. And it's not, it's sometimes it's based on how they look and whatever, you know, demographic box they, they, they fall into, but sometimes it's also, Oh, well, the people in legal are all this way, or the people in marketing are this. And maybe there's a bit of nuance that you might be missing and not just, it's not just important from a, how you talk to other people, but also how you manage the talent within your organization, because 
everybody is complex. Everybody is multifaceted, right? Even the most boring accountant will have it. And I'm sorry to accountants for like <laughs> picking on them, but they will have interests and dynamism in some capacity of their lives, right? right? And, and it might be outside of a work context, but the reality is everybody comes to their role with a much broader skill set than just their their sort of narrow little function. So to allow yourself to again just accept that as true. You might not know what the the, the expanded skill set is, but to at least go in with the operating assumption that this person is more than what they seem. Let them surprise you, let them pleasantly surprise you with, you know, what they're capable of and 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 what uh, other skills they can bring that will help your organization or help their team or whatever it looks like. I think that, yeah, willingness to just like be interested in people, right? And and have that curious approach to like, who am I talking to? Who is this person in front of me? What what else is going on beyond the superficial, beyond what I am assuming and what I am projecting? I think that is, again, another really uh, critical sort of intangible skill, but it's something that I, I, I do very consciously because everybody, has so much more going on than we ever realized. And again, it circles back to that humility, right? Like we don't know what else. And in in sometimes in a in a um, in a slightly sort of sad sense, like we don't know the struggles, right, that are happening behind the scenes. But in a more right. positive element, we also don't know what else they've got, right? Like what else they're made of, what other sort of gold. Uh, and, and I don't want to reduce people to like objects, but like you know, sort right. of what other what other skills they can bring to the table. Well. And I think that you're you're an example of that in the sense that here's this guy doesn't know you uh, reaches from the CIA reaches out yeah. to you where a lot of people might have just overlooked you because mm -hmm. you know they're, they're going to put you in a box. Yeah, and so yeah. here's this exactly. guy who said, "Let me see if I can you know for using your vernacular, let me see if I can be mm -hmm. surprised. Let me see yeah. whatever." Yeah. And so it changed, yeah. you know, it changed your life. You had an impact yeah. there at the CIA. So I think that's a a fabulous idea instead of putting people in a box let, mm -hmm. i like to see if they you know let them give yeah. them the opportunity to presently pleasantly surprise you right yeah I like exactly that. exactly all right so so let me ask you this when it comes to um specifically things from the cia was there a, a specific thing or a specific example of how the cia applies to a business strategy or how you applied it to a business strategy? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, another, and this is a bit more sort of uh, tangible, right? Uh, you, you finish before you start this idea that you plan it all out as much as you can in as much detail as you possibly can, you know, who's going to do this and what materials do they need and what, uh, you know, what time is are we going to do the check-ins and all of this stuff, this, and that is, again, it's, you can see why in a, in a CIA context or in a, in a sort of a, a foreign mission or a, any sort of sort of strategy that would be useful in a business context, that's incredibly valuable, right? Because from a from a financial planning perspective, from a resource planning perspective, if you finish to the extent possible, again acknowledging the uncertainty, acknowledging you know the randomness and all of the things that we just talked about, but finish the project right mentally at least, map it all out to the end, and then you can sort of back fill all of the things that you will need, so you can better predict hopefully or. or to uh, plan out as much of the uncertainty that you can control is, is one element of it. You can also better financially plan uh, sort of what resources are going to be required and and when there might be further injections of cash or or people or uh, or other sort of experts that you will need. Um, but that idea of finishing, seeing it through to the very end, and then working backwards gives you that as much of a as much predictability as is possible. And in a business context, that is so valuable. Now, I will say it, it there are limitations to it, but in, in, in most instances, starting with sort of finishing before you start can be really, really helpful because then you can also sort of scenario rehearse, even just mentally, right? Even with the other people on your planning committee or whatever it looks like, what and, and actually tangibly ask this question, well, what are some of the more likely things 
that could go wrong? And at what point will we reach perhaps a critical point if things are going too far down in this direction? What can we do to course correct, right? So planning all of that out, the contingencies, the uh, sort of the most likely disruptive scenarios, all of that stuff, thinking it through just makes then when you actually uh, sort of start executing on that plan, you can go in with a bit more confidence that you've thought through, of course, not every potential outcome, but the most likely, the most high impact. And it can take so much of the stress and the pressure away. And I think is, um, you know, there's a real art to it. It's not, it, it, well, there's a bit of mix of art and science, but right. again, fundamentally for, for no, if it does nothing else other than calm your own sort of internal dialogue and anxieties, that's, that's sort of in many ways done its job because that, and I talk about this a lot in different contexts is sort of like mastering that head game of performance yes. Yes. is a really, really challenging thing. And if you are feeling more confident, then you will also talk about the, the strategy or the plan or whatever it is more confidently. And it will sort of trickle out into those around you, right? And and people operate better when they're feeling confident than when they're feeling threatened or when they're feeling scared or nervous or, or worried, right? So again, sort of that head game, playing that head game to your advantage, this is one of the best ways of doing that. Yes, absolutely. I think that hopefully, hopefully all of our leaders, both in the military as well as in corporate, uh, in the in corporate leadership, you you plan the best you can as you're talking about. And, and I think you do have to plan for these uncertainties. I mean, nobody planned for the pandemic that yeah. shut down the world. And but I. I hope that we've learned something from there that, well, sure. it might happen again. It may not be yeah. this year, but sooner or later, it will happen again. Yeah. You know, the, the, one of my uh, favorite movies is uh, the zombie movie called World War Z. With, I love it too. Uh, okay. With Brad Pitt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brad Pitt. <laughs> yeah, I love one of my too. favorite parts of that yeah. movie is yeah. he's in Israel. Yeah. And 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 he asked the this Israeli leader, well, uh, how did you guys build these walls. Everybody got the same information at the same time, but Israel was the only one who acted and they built the, this massive fortification, these walls mm -hmm. around Israel. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the guy explains about the 10th man theory, right? That, that if the consensus is this will never happen, mm -hmm. the 10th man has to do the opposite. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Yes. they gave him the resources yeah. to to do what he thought would be best. And because he yeah. did the opposite of what everybody else, bam, 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 yes. saves Israel for a while. And there's a <laughs> there's a book I read. I, oh, I can't remember the name, but the one thing I took away from this book is what would have to happen for these assumptions to be real? Yeah. And when you start thinking like that, because again, your big point is there is so much that we don't plan for. We think, okay, Hey, if this happens, this will happen and we're going to make some amount of dollars or we're going to do this. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. what if it doesn't happen? What if it all goes wrong? Right. Yeah, so yeah. so yeah. a lot of us just don't do that. We avoid yeah. it. Matter of fact. Yeah. And I think it's that walking that, that, that really sort of finding that sweet spot between planning and then remaining agile. Right. So you do the plan, you do the contingency, you have the 10th man, you have to debate the, the holes and the threats and the, and the assumptions, et cetera. But then always, and the asterisk is always there, you have to be able to pivot and course correct in real time as the realities unfold in front of you. And so it's that combination of planning as much as you can, and then always going back to this idea of, well, what 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 am I working with in this moment, right? How can I, if we're here, if we're here and we need to be here, well, what can I work with now that will get us back on track? And how can I make these little mini corrections to to get us back more on plan and, and not just blindly following the plan, but again, be responding to real time. And that is sort of that, like I said, that sweet spot between planning and agility. And, and it, it takes practice. I think, yes. you know, we've all learned the hard way, right? From, from the pandemic and all of this sort of the constant hits that have been coming our way we can all do it we've proven the concept personally professionally we've all done it and organizationally we've done it but how can we embed that agility into the culture of how we make decisions and how we create organizations and that is for me like i said that real um it goes back to that mindset that learning mindset that that openness to you know being challenged to leaving room for disconfirming information and then moving forward and, and again focusing on what you can control Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I forgot to ask you this in the very beginning. 
Again, sure. the, the book is called uh, From the CIA to CEO. What was the inspiration behind mm. writing the book? For me, this was fundamentally about reaching more people to have more impact because I was having similar ish conversations around many of the topics, right, that we've talked about resilience, performance mindset, agility, humility, all of these big picture topics. I was having one on one conversations with executives, or I was having, you know, sort of group conversations with some of the companies that I've been working with. But I thought, look, none of these lessons are restricted to the the boardroom or to to a corporate context. These are universal life lessons, right? The tagline is unconventional life lessons for thinking bigger, leading better and being bolder. And my view was let's democratize this, right? Like I th th it shouldn't just be that people who are like working with me will have access to some of these tools and these frameworks. It can be valuable in any context. A book is an incredible way of, of at least giving people that access to some of the insights and some of the ideas. And so it was sort of a practical consideration. And that was sort of why, why, why it came into being. And a more personal consideration was I've always been a writer. I love to write. I've always, I've always written. I've always loved the process of finding the right word, of communicating through, through words. And so for me, it was like, wow, I can take a really important emotional, personal sort of bucket list box for myself, as well as give back to the world in some, in some way. Yeah, no, I, I like that. I like that. Uh, all right. So in the book, you talk about this thing called technical ignorance. Mm. Talk about technical ignorance. Yes. So let's, uh, I have to do a bit of explaining because I think it's the combination of the two words. We don't just take tactical and we don't just take ignorance. Ignorance is not a good thing, right? Like let's, we're not trying to bury our heads in the sand and make, you know, sort of put lipstick on a pig and be like, oh yeah, okay, this is, this is all great, right? Not what I'm talking about. The tactical sort of qualification on that word is what makes it really, really powerful. And again, it's sort of a performance tool. And the idea behind tactical ignorance is that we can all choose, not cherry pick, choose very consciously the inputs that we are letting in, right? Especially when it comes to performance or to pursuing a big vision or an ambition, because the reality is there are infinite ways something can fail. There are infinite ways that things can go wrong. There are infinite ways we will get in our own way. So being tactical about the inputs that we are letting in so that we are curating very consciously the things that will help us move in the direction that we want to go and to, again, achieve a goal, a vision and ambition, et cetera, et cetera. And, and not to be ignorant of, of, of some of the challenges or some of the um, maybe disconfirming information, but again, be very tactical, right? Know enough to, to make sure you're not falling foul of, of, of big, silly mistakes, but not so much that you're burdened by, well, this is how things have always been done and this has never been possible. And so it's more of a, sort of a mindset around what's possible, right? Because we all know anything, everything can fail spectacularly. Any and Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. But instead of obsessing over that and holding ourselves back from pursuing things, Accept that to be true, right? Don't go down that rabbit hole of like, what are the bazillion ways that I can fail in this endeavor? Instead, curate those inputs. Well, who are the people who have done it, right? What can I take inspiration from other fields, perhaps, in ways that can inform the way I'm approaching this endeavor or this project or this achievement or whatever else it is? So there's like a practical element in a just, you know, choose what's going to help you move forward with your goal. Again, the, the caveat always being as long as your goal is not like destructive and horrible and, and you know, dehumanizing anyone or anything, right? But <laughs> it's also a mindset tool because we can also get so, especially in a, in a leadership, in a, in a workplace context, or even in an interpersonal context, we can get so spun up around like the atmospherics and this person is so important and I'm so unimportant or they're so senior and I'm so junior or this is a really important client. Instead of focusing on what are we there to deliver? Like, what is the reason I'm being asked to be in this room? What is the reason I'm going to this meeting or this conference or talking to this client, right? And instead of saddling ourselves with this like, oh, well, I'm not good enough or imposter syndrome or whatever else it looks like, Again, tactically ignoring all of that stuff that you cannot control, right? You can't control how important or how interesting or how more senior or whatever, but focusing on what is going to help you deliver what you need to deliver in that moment. So a very practical way that I use this in my own in my own experience was 
when I was in a war zone, my one of the my main roles was to be the civilian intelligence briefer to the four star general in charge of the war effort. And here I am, a civilian woman, young. I was 26. Uh, all of these things on his turf, active war zone, et cetera, et cetera. And I could have. Most people are like, oh, God, you know, he's a four star general. And oh, and this is his lieutenant. And this is that, you know, ser sergeant, and you know, paying attention to the stripes and the stars and all of this stuff. I remember very consciously telling myself, I am not going to learn what any of those those symbols means because I know myself. I know that, you know, I can get wrapped up in the hierarchy and the right. who's who of, of things. And because I knew that about myself, I chose not to give that, give myself more work and more of a hard time than was already going to be, you know, in an already difficult context. Instead, I was like, okay, fine. They are who they are, right? I'm always going to respect them. And like you said earlier, like, or like we talked about earlier, have that just, you know, so we're all on an equal footing here, right? I'm, I'm not going to like put you on a pedestal, but I'm also not going to talk to you like you're unimportant. I acknowledge a four-star general, is, you know, requires respect and 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 I, I acknowledge his authority, but I'm not going to obsess over that. What I'm going to obsess over is how well can I prepare for this briefing? How can I ask good questions in the preparation of the briefing? What do I need to learn from my, my team back at headquarters? Doing all of that stuff so that when I am in that room, I am delivering the most value added, impactful, whatever it is, briefing that I possibly can, instead of worrying about like, oh my God, who's in the room and who's he talking to and who's next to this person, uh, right? Because that's irrelevant. That, that, that's not right. going to help me. That's not going to help them. So choosing to very tactically ignore the rank and the and the hierarchy and instead channeling that, that energy and effort into something much more productive that will help me achieve the goal of providing him some value and some and and some useful insights that's how tactical ignorance can can really help with performance based again that that head game right because so much of it is really just mastering what's happening in that conversation in your in your head before an important meeting before an important call or what conversation or whatever it looks like so don't give don't make it harder on yourself than it needs to be focus on your value focus on your preparation focus on what you are bringing to the table and why they have asked you to join that conversation instead of all of the other stuff yeah, I think that's great advice. Uh, and you're right. We have this inner dialogue, this constant fight. Are you, you know, who are you to give this four star <laughs> general advice? You've never even, you know, uh, been in a war or whatever. You're not a military person. You're 26 years old. That would be intimidating. But I love that this idea of technical ignorance. That doesn't matter. I'm putting all that aside. Yeah. And, and I think that works. I think anytime we're going to endeavor something big, uh, something yep. that's going to help us to grow, stretch, yep. right? Uh, it's something as simple as being a parent. Uh, I don't know too many parents that are ready to be a parent. And if you listen to that <laughs> your dialogue, I would have never had kids. I certainly was not prepared, right? Yes. I was like... You know, Bert, I'm so glad you brought that up because actually that is another really vivid example of when I use tactical ignorance, right? So I was considered a geriatric mom. I had my first child at 36, my second at almost 40. And... Uh, and I remember at the time being like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, I had friends who were going down that Google rabbit hole of like the risks of pregnancy and the risks of this. And, but I was like, no, I am consciously not going to go down because everybody's got an opinion about parenthood and what it means and how old is too old. Right. And this and, you know, right? Both from a medical perspective, as well. So of like it just a, like, let me just give you unsolicited advice. I don't need that, right? I don't need that noise. I don't need that distraction. I don't need anything else to make me feel more uncertain about this already really intimidating new experience, especially the first time. And I chose not to. I literally went on what I refer to as a low information diet. I listened to the experts, right? Like my doctor, my parents, other people who are like qualified to have the opinion and the advice and the whatever else. But beyond that, I wasn't going to worry about it, right? Like, I really wasn't because it was already such a big uh, unknown to me. I wasn't going to make it harder on myself than it had to be. So right. yeah, low information diet, qualified people taking their input and then just letting it be what it, I couldn't change the fact that I was 36 or almost 40. Right. right what I could right. change was how I was taking care of myself, what I was doing again, whose expertise and advice I was seeking, whatever, all of that stuff. But beyond that, it, the other stuff was not going to serve me. So I did not let myself get distracted by it. I love this idea of a low information diet. That is <laughs> yeah. qualified yeah. information, right? Yes. You got to get it from good sources, like people who are qualified in some way to have that, give that information. But yes, yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. So uh, this brings me to this because we've talked about uh, individuals and, and our own weirdness. How can individuals leverage their unique weirdness or their unique identities mm. and experiences for success in their careers? Oh, I love this question. So there are two pretty um, clear ways to me. One is first and foremost to know what those strengths are, right? Because so much of the conversation in schools and in, in workplace contexts is like working on your developmental areas and fixing this or filling that gap or retraining this. And of course, there's always room to improve, right? I get that. Let's, I'm not saying that you should just sort of stay stagnant, but there is a point at which there are some real diminishing returns from constantly trying to fix something that is seen as wrong or lacking instead of doing what I think is far more valuable, which is leveraging your strengths, right? We all have strengths. We all have, sure, weaknesses, blind spots, whatever you want to call them. But let's be real. By the time we're in our 30s, at a push, like probably even mid-20s onwards, that core of our strengths and our core of our developmental areas, it's not really gonna change, right? So know what your strengths are, find ways to leverage those strengths in a conscious, tangible way in your workplace context. And by the way, this is true, whether you're starting your first job or you're a seasoned executive, right? Like many people still feel like, oh, well, I need to be like the chief everything officer. And if I don't, you know, master every element of my business, then I, you know, I, I don't deserve to be here kind of thing. That's total nonsense, right? You hire smart people to fill in the gaps, but you double down on your strengths. You double right. down on the fact that you're an amazing communicator or amazing tactician or an amazing strategist or a financial whiz or whatever it looks like, right? But the reality is your strengths are yours. Other people's strengths are theirs. Let's not try to be everything to every all people at all times. It's, it's, it's a losing game and it's also just not possible. So know what your strengths are. Find ways to bring them to bear more, more, con more consciously and tangibly in your workplace context. For me, that has always been communication analysis and, and, and some form of, of making connections, right? So at the agency, I volunteered for briefings. I made sure that, you know, yes, I was doing the work behind the scenes, the analytical work, but I was doing as many briefings as I possibly could because that was leveraging my strengths, right? And some other of my colleagues preferred to do more of the analytical work behind the scenes and less of the briefing. And that, fine, let's play right. to that, you know, that beautiful interplay. But know what your strengths are. Stop trying to constantly make up for things that might need, you know, sort of not your, your strengths. And then... So that's one thing. So know and leveraging your, your strengths. And then also being willing to, and this is uh, maybe slightly counterintuitive, but it related to my first answer, which is being okay, being a competent half-ass at everything else, right? Because again, the reality is you're not going to be able to master all the things, but, and let's be grownups about this, you might have to be at least a little bit conversant or even competent in things that are just really hard for you, right? So right. again, you know the realities of your work, of your position, of your responsibilities. It doesn't mean that you're just like, no, but this is who I am and I'm not going to do all that other stuff. No, D develop and invest in and leverage the core of the skills, but also be willing to be just good enough at the other stuff so that you can maintain your role. You can, you know, sort of push things through that need to get pushed through or, or be successful in whatever context you're in, but you cannot be everything. So it's this, uh, again, it goes back to that, that confidence of like, I know what I'm good at and I will use that as much as I can to help the organization, to help my people, to help whatever. And also, I will also acknowledge where that line is between me knowing enough to be useful and then me trying too hard to, to do things that are I'm never going to be an expert at. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's first and foremost, like I said, about being very conscious and concrete about what your strengths are. I like that so much. <laughs> and I love the, the, the half assery uh, comment there, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and it's good. I, I, and I agree with you. Yeah. I, I like, I like to know, enough, like you said, to be able to hold a conversation. So these yeah. terms that I'm not going, well, I got to look up that term or what does that mean? At least, yeah. you know, somewhat, but exactly. again, you, it's not your area of expertise. Yeah. And so I think that's a valid point. And, and yeah. I, I think that one of the biggest mistakes I made early on as an entrepreneur, as a business owner is I would hire people that 
mirrored mm -hmm. me, right? And, mm -hmm. and so they had the same skill set as I did because yep. I understood those people. But guess what? Yep. That's a great way to bottleneck your business. You got to find yeah, people exactly. that have the opposite strengths and bring them in. And yeah. and and and. But exactly. anyway, so absolutely, I love this idea of just building yeah. on your strengths. All right, let me ask you this: because part of life, part of business, part of of uh, anything uh, worthwhile doing is going to involve uh, setbacks and obstacles. So, how do you advise, or what advice do you have for those? entrepreneurs who may face mm -hmm. obstacles or setbacks along their journey, what advice would you give to them? Uh, it's going to be a bit of tough love. And the tough love is you chose this route, right? Well, in many instances, maybe not all. Uh, you chose to be an entrepreneur. You chose to do something unconventional, a little bit risky, a little bit, you know, where there aren't sort of very well trodden paths necessarily. So it's just part of what you signed up for, right? There will have been challenges and setbacks if you had done something a bit more traditional, right? Nobody gets to just have this like beautifully coasting career and life forevermore, right? There's always gonna be something that shakes things up, puts you out of your comfort zone or is, is incredibly overwhelming and, and it feels like the world is trying to crush you. That's just life, right? So I think acknowledging that this is what we sign up for is, is just, just being real about it, right? right, right. There's no easy way to success. There's no easy way to, to, to pursue something that's really important to you. You have to be clear eyed about what you're, what you're, what you've signed up for. And also, uh, because it is universal, because everybody goes through setbacks, whether they talk about them or not, everybody has faced every entrepreneur has faced that oh shit moment of like this is make or break right i can either it's either all going to work out or i'm going to go bankrupt or it's all going to work out and i'm going to have to start from from scratch again or whatever it is right there are these these real sort of pivotal moments or there are things like the pandemic where it all feels like it's hanging on a very right. fine and getting increasingly <laughs> finer thread and somehow you find a way to make it through so Again, accepting that as the universal experience. Yes, some people might have an easier time of it than others, but again, you don't have the full picture there. So maybe they're just not sharing how difficult it was. But because it is just part of what you sign up for, you have a choice, again, to either give up and there's no value judgment, right? Like it's freaking hard. I will not criticize anyone for trying it and realizing, you know what, actually this isn't for me. I thought it was gonna be something else and it's just not for me. Again, having that humility and self-awareness to say, nope, I'm done. Cool, you walk away. But if that is not what you want, if that is not, if you actually don't think that it's too much, then you have no choice but to keep going, right? So it's be very clear about it like, and almost make it, a, I mean, because it is fundamentally, you have two choices. You either keep going or you quit. Right. So quit, cool, no big deal. No, no, like no shame, no, no harm, whatever. Like that is okay. It is genuinely okay. But if you're not gonna quit then what are you gonna do about it, right? Who can you talk to for help? Who can, maybe you just need to reset. Maybe you need to take a bit of a break. Maybe you need a bit of a reality check. Maybe you need to get some professional advice. Maybe you need to talk to somebody else in your industry who's done it and who's seen themselves through a couple of the economic cycles or a couple of the growth cycles, right? But there's always something you can do, something you can learn, a conversation you can have to just rebuild that momentum because we all have those times. I remember, vividly there were times especially in my first business early days about like god maybe like 10 months in i mean early early days i was under my covers in bed crying snot tears like angry at the world <laughs> angry at the people who had let me down angry at the people who weren't doing what they said they were going to do angry at everything right Right. And those cycles would sometimes last that like anger and frustration and just like, I hate everything and I hate everyone. And like, this all sucks. Sometimes those, the, that like period would last for a really long time. Like that energy of just like, Ugh. and so, but that, but I wasn't willing to quit despite feeling like that for long stretches of time. And even in like the depths of that despair and that frustration and that anger and anxiety, I had to do something, right? Like the business required me to do something, to change something, to fire someone or to, to work with someone new or whatever it was. And so I had to just do the things. I had to just go through and just do what was necessary to do. 
And then what I sort of learned, again, through this, the hard trials of especially the early days, was I am a very emotive person, like I need to get the emotions out, but I don't need to let that last for weeks or months, right? That is not helpful. And so to short circuit my own way of behaving, my own sort of knowing of like who I am, I, to this day, Bert, and this is no joke, when I find myself in that spiral or that like anger or frustration or whatever it is of just like, oh, I set an alarm for myself. I give myself 15 minutes. And when that, and I will, for that 15 minutes, I will scream, I will curse, I will do the crying and the snot or whatever is called for in that moment, right? However bad it feels. And sometimes literally punch some pillows or whatever I need to do. When that alarm goes off, that is the trigger for me. Okay, done. Like wipe yourself down, get a drink of water. Now, what are you going to do to move forward? So set that alarm. Cool. If that's what you need to do, get it out of your system. But then if you're not going to quit, focus on the next step. Focus on the small next step. It can literally just be picking up a, a, a phone and talking to a friend. It doesn't even have to be about your business, but just something small to get you out of that inertia and, and start you back on that like proactive, what am I going to do? How can I respond? What can I learn? Who can I ask for help? All of that stuff that, again, goes back to controlling the controllables, right? Yes. Success is not guaranteed, but you can guarantee what you do because you are only in control of what you do. Absolutely. And I think... Uh, that, uh, like you said, uh, everybody's going to have an obstacle and a struggle. And if you're really building something big, you're going to have more than one. I look at Elon mm -hmm. Musk, who's had public oh, yeah. failures, who has yeah. tons of people that just totally dislike him. But, mm -hmm. you know, right now, Tesla stock is just crashing. Uh, people are making fun of him at, after taking over Twitter and changing it to mm -hmm. X and all mm -hmm. these other things. But yet he's got a huge record of success because he doesn't give up. He handles the obstacles. He handles the negative publicity. He handles uh, 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 all the criticisms. And one of the things that I've learned to do, uh, I will use comedy as a way of snapping myself out mm -hmm. of it. Uh, I, I'll watch yeah. a couple of stand-up comics yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. that'll get me laughing. And yeah. okay, all right, now I can think. Because yeah. back to that earlier, look, if we're in a negative spiral, if we're in fear, if we're in doubt mm -hmm. and worry, it's hard to be creative and think of a solution. Of course, yeah. And, and and also, I love, I really do love this idea of of giving you uh, fifteen minutes or thirty minutes. <laughs> you set this alarm. You have the uh, the angry cry, the ugly cry, the snot, <laughs> the you know pillow punching, yeah. whatever it is that you need to get out of it. But then once that alarm goes off, it's you know. Boom. Put your big girl pants back on, right? Like, come on, people. We are grownups, right? We have agency. We have choice. We have options. Like, let's just, again, yeah, like I said, put your big girl panties back on and, and, and keep moving. Keep moving. That's <laughs> it. That's yeah. it. I, I, yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, all right. So uh, I, um, I want to give out another shout out to the book. It's called yeah. uh, From CEO, I'm sorry, From CIA to CEO. And I, I did it uh, just for you guys. Uh, RuPaul Patel, she, as you guys already know, is former CIA analyst turned serial entrepreneur, recognized for her trailblazing career spanning military briefings to corporate boardrooms. She's also a uh, speaker, and uh, you can check her out at rupalpatel.com. Oh, uh, it's rupalypatel.com. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, okay. The why is important because otherwise yeah. you won't get to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. So I will put I will put the links here in the show notes. But it has been such a blast having you and getting to know you. And your energy is contagious. And uh, looking forward to have you back again. Thank you so much, Bert. I, we covered some wonderfully broad ground and I loved this conversation and you asked wonderful questions, some of which I'd never gotten before. So thank you so much for, for having me here.